we are now doing what I'm calling endocrine 12, okay, in this series of hormones and glands. Well, lo and behold, the subtitle of this lesson is the endocrine pancreas. Now, if you're not aware that the pancreas, I'm going to show you some actual glands, is really two glands all rolled up into one, and they're not distinct. The two glands cannot be separated with anything, even the blunt probes that I like. So we've got to be careful here. Endocrine pancreas. That's the part of the pancreas that makes hormones. To show you how you could study the whole pancreas or parts, I've got some book covers. Uh, oops, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted one up here. Pathology of the pancreas. Well, here you're going to study everything that maybe can go wrong with the pancreas. It wouldn't be surprising if it was separated into a couple parts. Here's another book. Talks about the exocrine pancreas. Okay? Exocrine. If you forgot what that means, that means some, some solution is going to come out of a duct. D-U-C-T. Like sweat comes out of a duct. So sweat is an exocrine secretion. The pancreas makes pancreatic juice that comes out of a duct and it gets dumped into the lumen of the small intestine. We'll show you some anatomy. But this lesson is on the endocrine pancreas. So here's another book cover I found. Endocrine pancreas. So look at how you could have talk about the endocrine pancreas. Not talk about the exocrine, or you can, or the whole thing. Amazingly complicated. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a series of diagrams and pictures to show you some of the anatomy and the parts within the pancreas that we can see with a microscope. So on this nice little diagram, I want to bring down, and I'm going to leave it on here, talks about the whole pancreas, but it's an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland, so you got to remember that. We're going to concentrate on two main hormones, insulin and glucagon. It, it actually produces four total hormones. I'm talking about the endocrine pancreas now. For this introductory level, I'm doing insulin and glucagon, and you should realize that they are an antagonistic pair. So over here, and the right hand drawing, the pancreas is kind of a nondescript fat looking like organ in the first loop of the small intestine as it leaves the stomach. The stomach would be here. So it's easy to find if you know where it's at. If you've never dissected an animal looking for a pancreas, you would always miss it, guaranteed. Of course, it's got the gallbladder here, so we know this could be a dog or a cat or human. We know it can't depict a horse. Horses don't have gallbladders. Rats don't have gallbladders. There's a number of animals that don't have a gallbladder. The endocrine part actually is called islets of Langerhans. That's how it's organized. And we're going to concentrate on beta cells in that island that secrete insulin and then alpha cells that secrete glucagon. We're not worrying about anything else. So now I just want to show you a couple other fine drawings that somebody has made. Actually, one's a picture. This is a drawing to show you again that there's an exo exocrine part. And all the exocrine parts are going to make pancreatic juice. And with the arrows here, they're not showing a duct. But the duct always leads into the small intestine. Always. All the fluid made goes in the small intestine. The endocrine pancreas is made up of islets of Langerhans. They're going to make their hormone. The hormone's going to diffuse, insulin and glucagon in our case, diffuse to a nearby capillary bed and then leave by the blood supply. That's the definition of a hormone. Okay, here are some pig pancreases. I think there is not such a word as pancreae, so I don't think. So pancreases from the pig. And look at when you're dissecting that out, you could easily miss that as being fat and cut it up and leave it and miss it. And you know by now I'm a very visual person, so when I find 
a great diagram. I try to share it with you. The endocrine pancreas. It actually doesn't show the islets, but if I had to cut out, or if I could cut out the islands, the islets of Langerhans and weigh them, they would be no more than about 5% of the weight of the whole pancreas. So 95% of the pancreas is basically tissue that makes the pancreatic juice, and it flows out the duct work. And about 5% of the mass of the pancreas would be the endocrine tissue. And you can read the diagrams, some the labels, by pausing it. Okay, so now let's look at some of those islands, islets of Langerhans the islet of Langerhans. This is one. Remember, I'm only going to concentrate on two of the four hormones made. This diagram actually shows three. There's actually four hormones. I'm going to do insulin, which is from the beta cells, and glucagon from the alpha cells. And here's a little mnemonic device. It, it's not very good, but if you want to remember what cell type makes what hormone, I came up with this word bi -ag. Beta cells make insulin. Alpha cells make glucagon. I'm not sure how good that is, but I tried. Then, another diagram here that actually probably shows a real photomicrograph to show you how those islets of Langerhans are truly islets amid a sea of exocrine tissue. And since I like histology, a couple more images, some very well labeled images. I think we can get it on the screen. Okay, this is a higher power than before. So you have an eyelid of Langer hands. They're not perfectly circular like before, but it's an endocrine part. So here I'm gonna outline, and you can see they stain different. So, and this would only show up with staining. So there's an islet, and then there's some pancreatic ducts. That's gonna carry the pancreatic juice to the small intestine. Of course, you have to have blood vessels, right? And there's a number of them. This one is actually empty. This one looks like it has a group of red blood cells that have gathered because of the staining. And then here's some part of the exocrine, the actual, exocrine tissue making the pancreatic juice. Then let me get rid of that. And then this is even more high power. This would be, oh, I don't know, 800 power, something like that. And just another view of the endocrine cells and then the exocrine cells. But you can't see this with the naked eye without staining. And then this is the use of a microscope. But uh, definitely can pick out the differences when there is a microscope and staining has occurred. Now, this fine diagram that somebody made is perfect, really, because it shows what one hormone does, the other one does the opposite. Let's start at the very bottom in the 6 o'clock position. Let's say we have low blood sugar. Well, you know that's called hypoglycemia. Maybe let me spell it for you. Okay, so I typed up hypoglycemia, and you can break that word apart. It's perfect. Hypo is low. Emia always means blood at the end of the, set of the word, and glyc refers to glucose. So low blood sugar, I can move this over there, is hypoglycemia. Now I'm watch my laser pointer. That's going to be sensed by the pancreas and the pancreas is going to release glucagon well because remember now we want to raise blood sugar so glucagon goes by the blood into the uh, liver sorry this is liver and it stimulates glycogen breakdown glycogen is a storage form of glucose so then you would get glucose coming out here and it raises blood sugar levels, okay? That's the actions of glucagon. So you follow it this way, this way, this way. Okay, now 
let's say we have plenty of glucose, maybe too high. That's called hyperglycemia. So what happens? Well, the pancreas is going to sense high blood glucose, and it's going to release insulin. Now here's two actions actually of insulin. You gotta follow the arrows. Let's go this way first. Insulin goes to all base, basically all body cells and tells the tissue, the cells, to uptake insulin, or sorry, uptake glucose. So I said uptake glucose. That's gonna lower blood sugar. Then insulin also is gonna to go to the liver and that's going to stimulate glycogen formation. It takes glucose to make glycogen, so that would also lower blood sugar levels. So the balance between the two really gets you in ideal blood sugar levels. Okay, so sometimes we like to talk about pathophysiology. That means when things don't work really right. Let's look at the top diagram first. Diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Well, they've got the pancreas here. And with type 1 diabetes, you don't get a lot of insulin released by the pancreas. So here they've got decreased insulin in the blood. That's not going to stimulate a lot of cells to take up glucose. So you end up with increased glucose in the blood. So that'd be hyperglycemia because there's not enough insulin to tell cells. Okay, so then the muscles are unable to use glucose because they really aren't taking in the glucose because there's not enough insulin. Now on type 2 diabetes, we have sufficient insulin. So there's plenty. This is in the blood. There's plenty of insulin. But there's a resistance. There's insulin resistance. Muscle is unable to use a glucose because of insulin resistance. And you end up with also increased glucose in the blood. By the way, if you get increased glucose in the blood, there's also increased glucose in the urine. Now on this side for type one, sometimes if you break down these proteins and glycogen too much, you have what's called ketoacidosis. That's a clinical sign. On type 2, it says obesity, sometimes times your genes, whatever genes you get from your parents and other factors can lead to resistance. Now I'm going to enlarge it so we can read this small type over here. And then I'm going to go back at the end to leaving it in the normal size. So let's read this part here. Typically, now this is for type 1, occurs before the age of 40 and is caused by insulin deficiency. It cannot be reversed, at least at the present time, and the affected individuals rely on external, or you could say extrinsic, insulin. Okay, let's go read the text from the bottom one. Type 2 now diabetes typically occurs after the age of 40 and is caused by insulin resistance. So there's plenty of insulin around, but the cells don't know how to react to it. It can potentially be reversed through diet and lifestyle, and I'm not an expert at this, but uh, decrease people can decrease their weight, get active, and it's maybe one of the things that can help, but you need to consult with a physician for that. I'm just showing you the normal physiology here in this pathology, pathological state. Okay, so I'm going to leave it right there and I'm done.